Hey, everyone. Welcome to our Unfiltered podcast. My name is Lee Stevenson. I have the privilege of being the executive director of Church Planting, and here's my co-host. I'm Danny Parmley, and I oversee Church Planting in Converge Mid-America. And uh, we're just excited to be with you today, having real church planting conversations, raw, just what you hear is what you get, right? Exactly. So uh, let, let's talk a little bit today, uh, Danny, about um, that weird transition that takes place in a church plant, because early on, you're in kind of launch team phase, you're building momentum towards a grand opening, and then the grand opening happens, and then you have to move into like being a church, you know, and I can remember, um, you know, Sunday nights, launch team, very intimate, had a lot of fun. And then we hit Sunday morning, had our grand opening. I can remember very vividly walking out of the movie theater going, oh, like, we have a church now. Like, yeah. we got to do this now every week. Um, and there is a major difference between launch team meetings and, uh, you know, now that you're on a normal Sunday morning kind of routine being a, a church. What what did you guys notice in that transition time period? Um, what would you do differently? Um, what do you say? Go no, this did work very well for us, and um, let's let's just have a, a conversation a little bit about that. Uh, well, I think one of the things that you brought up is first of all, even just for the planter to prepare uh, themselves, because there is so much energy. I mean, for some uh, for some guys, it's it's two years in the making that you're going to this launch and it's like this huge event and then it happens and, and it, there is that kind of oh my goodness this is not the end this is really the beginning so I think to just even kind of emotionally prepare uh, for that next week the other thing is is if you had a successful launch and it's super exciting you have maybe hundreds of people there whatever it is uh, maybe your expectations hopefully were met maybe they weren't exactly uh, but the second week is often very, very hard, even just from a numbers perspective. Totally. So just to kind of remember that. And the other thing is to kind of coach your team through that a little bit, because they, too, have been carrying all this excitement, kind of coming to this this pinnacle, this this um, huge event, this huge point. Uh, and they, too, are kind of feeling the same thing, like, oh, my goodness, we need to do this uh, week in and week out. So I think just a lot of even coaching up to that point with your team, talking about expectations of launch, but then talk about expectations kind of um, after that uh, a little bit. And um, especially just numbers and attendance wise. And then uh, definitely as it, it, it kind of depends on size of the church. But I think that the amount of direct um, contact and relationship that members uh, that launch team members had with you um, may change and to kind of help to kind of uh, prep them for that. It doesn't mean that after launch, all of a sudden you become this celebrity pastor that hides yeah. in their office yeah. and you never get to talk to anyone, but it may be a little bit different than it was before where every single phone call, you know, you can meet them for coffee for everything that's going on in their life, good, bad, and different that now you're having to um, shift some of your time either to new people within the church or developing relationships more within the community. Oh, that's great. And I, and I do think you hit upon two real important expectations. One, expectations of, you know, the relational connection with the pastor, um, but also just the size once you actually launch um, how things are going to change, both good and challenging week two, week three. And now you kind of know, okay, this is really what we have to, to build from. I'm reminded even now as we're preparing to launch this church here in Orlando that the launch team phase is honestly, it's a little weird. Um, you know, we're so ingrained in the normal church world um, that, you know, I, to, to liken it to how I've heard it said is, you know, you're in your garage trying to get a new business up and off the ground and you're trying to get people invest their time, their money, all those different things to help get this new thing up and off the ground. And and it, people have a hard time with that, especially if you are not futuristic at all, that that launch team phase for people that are not early adapters to kind of use that language um, is challenging. And so it, it, there is a challenging point. But we talked about previously the difference between core team versus launch team. And that is a important distinction to have in those those early days. Um, but I, I agree. I, I think you want to sit down with your launch team, you know, even weeks preparing them before the launch with a, a real clear understanding of, hey, this is what it's going to take. Like if you're in the children's ministry, it actually may be two or three months before you actually get into a service, 
um, because it, it's going to take that amount of time to reach and connect and, and help new people that have come in, understand who you are, where you're going, how do you recruit them, how do you train them, then get them on a schedule, and who's going to fill that gap in, in the midst of that. And, and I know for you guys, you, you didn't actually start with children's ministry, did you? Uh, no, it m- might have been. Actually, I don't think we even had babysitting at that time because it was mostly uh, young couples uh, without kids and college students. So we didn't have a lot of children's and we started on Saturday night. So we didn't have a ton of families. Yeah. What What were some of those key teams that you, you pushed your launch team into so yeah. that they were prepared for that grand opening? Yeah. So um, obviously worship team uh, type of stuff and then kind of uh, the connections or new people. And then we, since we kind of started off with a small group base, we were really trying to point people either towards some sort of small group uh, leadership. And then we did some community kind of outreach type of thing. Let's so. talk a little bit on the small group going from launch team to yep. church perspective, because that's something yep. that we're doing as, as well, even right now. Um, what did you do? How did you prepare? How did you get people plugged in? What did small groups actually do during the launch side? Um, and how did it change once you actually became a, a normal church? Yeah, so I wish I could say that um, I had this all planned out perfectly, but it did actually work out well for us is that we uh, we had really started with kind of small group multiplication. So when I uh, first came into town, started a men's small group, which eventually uh, multiplied into two men's small groups. And then because of girlfriends and spouses, those multiplied into four. So we had four different small groups before we ever launched. And so for us, it was kind of this seamless thing. And it was actually part of our our DNA. And because we didn't have kids, uh, like there, there weren't a lot yeah. of children, it made it easier to kind of multiply these small groups. So it basically then uh, once we launch, we encourage other people join one of these four small groups, which then quickly became five small groups and six small groups uh, and kind of really continued to be kind of at the heart of of our um, small groups ministry, which the reason I say that I wish I would have, um, you know, I, I didn't plan it that way. It's just the way that it kind of happened for a lot of guys. If they don't start small groups until way later, like maybe even a year into the church, it's it's just an uphill battle if it's not part of the culture already. So but what what did um from a curriculum standpoint what were your yeah. groups doing in the early phase and did it stay the same once you actually launched or did it actually change yeah so it stayed the same uh, from launch so uh, from the beginning we kind of went through um books of the bible okay. uh and so for me i literally wrote it the night after the sermon and wrote email, kind of questions wrote, and, okay. wrote basically here's here's six to eight nothing like wait until the last minute man so <laughs> well i didn't know exactly what my sermon was going to be about <laughs> until that maybe that saturday morning so um that has definitely changed over time but it really did for us again set the pace in the culture that small groups we did sermon based small groups which again became hugely a part of our our dna and again it was just it was honestly just kind of what I thought I was supposed to do and we kind of just did and it became uh, something. Now it became more robust. But for me, uh, especially in the beginning, it wasn't even just about Bible training type of thing. I just, I wanted people to get together and this was the easiest way to kind of say, well, here's a way that is reproducible uh, for us because it wouldn't matter than if we had six small groups or 10 small groups or 20 small groups. There was kind of that curriculum that was being generated really for everyone to go nice. through the exactly exact same thing. Nice. So nice. Um, we would do that through the school year. We yeah. kind of followed our church calendar, really followed the school year. And then the summer, it was a little bit kind of more open for people to do whatever they wanted. And they did whatever hot topic or whatever they wanted to do, or whatever the Bible study that was kind of floating around out there, fun to do. People would do that. Oh, that's that's great. We're we're actually similar thing. Um, first church plant, small groups were a major part early on, um, and getting them to pray, getting them to talk about even in their group setting what is to come, help build the excitement towards the the actual grand opening. Um, this time around, we're actually we just call them launch groups. Um, and so we, we're, they're small groups getting them used to, but they understand that once the grand opening comes and we transition into normal church kind of rhythms and, and, and the calendar year that the launch group, this goal is to split. And the language that we're using is like the launch phase is acts one. Mm-hmm. 
grand opening and beyond is Acts 2. And okay. so we we know, at least this time around, Acts 2 is coming. Mm-hmm. And so the Acts 1 scene is us preparing ourselves, yeah. our heart, everything for Acts 2 when it does show up. That's great. And, uh, and so we're, we're praying with big expectations that God will do something great once that. But helping them understand, like, this is fun, but we don't exist for us. Mm-hmm. We exist for those that aren't here yet and really yeah. building momentum so that that grand opening is um, exciting, fun, high energy, but helping them understand like your goal is now to connect with new people when they walk mm-hmm. in the door, yep. build a relationship, help them feel comfortable. Um, we as a pastor can only do so much. And, and so it's going to take a team in order for us to be able to do this. Yeah. Um, when you're uh, launching, one of my questions is um, – uh, how do you create space for new people right away so that it's, hey, you may become part of this church, but again, they're only there one Sunday. Do you already invite them in to say, hey, we've got opportunity not only to participate in small groups, but lead or or volunteer in these other things? How do you, how do you, how are you guys approaching uh, great, that? Or, great question. I think it's a combination of subliminal messaging <laughs> and, and honest ask. And so, um, there, there are even up on our website, we already have like ways to get involved. Okay. Um, and so it's just trying to build in our culture. This is kind of who we are. Um, it'll be in our kind of program that we get, we hand out to people. And, and I don't know what you saw. I know the first time we planned, I mean, people would walk out of the very first service we've ever done grand opening and they're going, I'm all in, like, this is my church. And how do I become a member? You know, wait, 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 wait. I'm glad you're excited, but we need to kind of get to know you. And you do, honestly, you don't know us. Yeah. And, and usually so, those people don't come back anyways. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that's exactly true. Um, but one of the things too, that uh, um, we will do is within that first month and then it'll become a monthly routine is we're just going to have a lunch with the pastors following the, the our service um, where it's just an opportunity for us to, uh, to kind of share our stories. They get to know us, but mm-hmm. it gives me a chance to truly share the vision for the church, where we're going and help them understand like you have a role, you have a story. God has uniquely wired you. We want to help you unearth what that is and how to best mm-hmm. use those gifts and to use the experiences that you've had in the past to further his kingdom. Um, we're really, we really are focused on being gift oriented ministry versus warm body ministry. Right. Um, you know, and, and so I'll speak more to that. What you mean? Yeah. I, I think a lot of, um, I see it happening in a lot of churches across the board, whether or not it's a church plan or even an existing church where there's a need. And because there's a need, they will literally take whatever warm body we possibly can find to fill that gap. Um, Which is often children's ministry. Very often children's ministry. Um, And so one of the things that we've intentionally focus in on is is we want to place people within their giftings, within their wirings, Um, whether or not you're introvert, extrovert, whether or not you you want you feel like you connect well with kids or whether or not you're a techie. Um, we we want to help identify what those are, get you plugged into those specific areas, because long term, we honestly know that that is going to be better for the church and it's going to be better for that individual, that they're going to want to serve when they see God using them and working through their gifts. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you communicate that um, from the stage or do you not communicate that from the stage? How do you create that culture and ethos of um, gift-based ministry instead of just need-based? Some of it is just saying it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even from day one is is helping understand, you know, there's been people that have sacrificed, given time, mm-hmm. talents, treasure, mm-hmm. all that in order for us to get to where we're at. Um, we believe that this isn't it. We believe that God wants to do more and continue to take us further to reach more people and impact more people. That means everybody, you got to find your spot. And we want to help you engage, understand who you are. And uh, first step would be, you know, come to like a meet the pastors, a lunch with the pastors type of experience. From there, then we try to onboard them into um, our discipleship process. And I think the sooner that you can begin to talk about that pre-launch, you create the expectation that post-launch, this is who we are. This is how we operate. And for instance, um, we kind of use a 4E process. Um, We said, number one, everybody needs to engage um, um, spiritually in worship with Jesus daily and with other, you know, other believers. 
Um, and so that's the first step. Where are you at in that process? How are you taking inventory of, of where you're at in that? So second of all is established. Um, we want you to be established in godly relationships that are going to further and push you further along in, in your walk. And and then you figure out the bridge events. How do you go from engaged with Jesus, you know, corporately and individually to now being established in group life is basically what it is. From there, it's about being equipped. Um, it's helping you understand your wiring, how God has gifted you, um, how you might be able to use those gifts to further the kingdom. And then lastly is, is established. Um, or, I mean, um, so equipped, it's empowered. Um, so it's empowered now to use those ministries to continue the cycle in somebody else's life. Um, so it's really about multiplication. Like the, this is a cyclical thing. And we talk about it as it's, it's a wheel. It's it's a tire. So the goal is to get this wheel moving and keep it moving. And um, if we're not doing all four of those things in our own personal lives, we, we lose momentum. Um, I have a question about... Um the transition from launch in the beginning with launch team, you have a, the planter has a, a good amount of control, even over agenda harmony. You're interviewing people, you know, who's going to be on your team, who has leadership. At what point does that begin to loosen where now it's the leaders underneath you who are beginning to invite people to their team? Um, do you have anything to that's either very specific in place or is that just is that just the natural flow like okay well once you have this launch team now pretty soon i yeah, have to trust yeah. others to empower or how do you keep it so that all of a sudden launch sunday you have a whole group of random people that show up that could just you know well and they do i mean it and i think this we should do this probably as another podcast conversation sometime is is the the conversation about church plant weirdos mm -hmm. um because the, the moment that you have your grand opening it's like all the crazies all the weirdos in your community are going to show up to your church um and they're going to have their own agendas they're going to have their own cultural beliefs not necessarily they're not necessarily wrong they may just be different than where you feel God is calling you as a leader and your church to, to kind of be in what gap to fill. Um, I do think the more that you have some specifics written out, um, you know, from a culture standpoint, this is who we are, this is how we operate, um, will help you fight some of those battles. Because honestly, you know, that there are going to be battles that come out as a result. People are going to want to do it this way or they're going to, and you have to make a decision like, does that, take away from our culture? Or is that adding to this culture? Um, and that helps you understand what battles you need to fight. But I think you have to trickle those things into your leadership team as well. And, and what will happen early on is they will come to you for the answers. Like, hey, mm -hmm. my friend or so-and-so I engage, this is the conversation they're having with me. You will have to coach them and engage them. Well, is that who we are? Well, no. Mm -hmm. So why didn't you have this conversation with them? And so you, you challenge them in their own personal leadership to That's lead good. those conversations. And the more that you feel, they feel like you're empowering them, the better that they will do. Um, but you got to make sure that they get it because honestly, these things leak, you know, vision yeah. leaks, culture leaks, um, people will forget, um, people's feelings get in the way. And so you, you do have to fight against those to, to preserve the culture that you believe that God has called you guys to, to establish. Um, do you, and, and people have different opinions on this, but what's your opinion on allowing new people, non-Christians to serve in the church? Is that a yay or nay for you? Uh, it depends on what position. Okay. Um, so upfront positions, um, you know, whether or not it'd be like teaching children's, mm -hmm. um, anything on stage from a upfront leading people conversationally in singing. Um, yes, we would say my personal bent is um, I want to see them believers. If it's greeting people in the parking lot or at the front doors, um, helping out in office work during the week, um, filling in as a drummer or something like that. I, I really don't care. Um, we look at that as an opportunity to, to bring them in on the journey with us. And, um, you know, I had greeters that I'm, I'm sure didn't quite know who Christ was and had crossed that line early on in the, our, our church plan and even at d different seasons, but I have seen them get it and make decisions and begin to follow Christ and their entire life change um, because we allowed them to belong before they technically believed. Yeah. Um, have you, and, and what'd you guys do? Yeah. Um, we I'm throwing you the question. Yeah, back, yeah. man. Um, I'm trying to think back. I think that um, we were all over the board and there was times where we're like, no, 
<laughs> you know, it's got to be they have to be a believer. Everybody does because it would be unfair. And then it's like, wait, it's unfair to have it be this position. And then we eventually came to this place like it is going to be unfair. Yeah, so we just have yeah. to figure out and to use discernment. And we wanted to codify it. We wanted it to be black and white for every situation. And we just realized it never was. And that church just isn't black it and white. It just isn't. And that yeah. are there going to be hurt feelings and hard discussions along the way because of that? And then we figured out, yep, that's going to be. So it we, we not that we take it case by case, but we would uh, essentially totally, kind of look totally. at some different yeah. Yeah. Uh, some different things that way. That's great. That's great. I, I think the, the biggest takeaway in preparing your launch team for the grand opening and post grand opening is really, you do need to clarify the expectations, not having key conversations ahead of time probably will backfire you backfire on you, you know, week two, week three, week four, um, even in just six months later, if you don't help them understand, like, this is why we exist as a launch team. This is where we're going. Things will radically change um, and really clarify that for your team. And, and that'll be helpful. Yeah. And I, I think just encouraging um, honesty, because as much as people say, oh, I'm so excited and I want all these new people. And if if there's new people, I know that that'll mean change for me. Um, and I'm all about that. And then when the change actually happens, they they feel it and then they don't want like, to. This is different than I thought it would be. Yeah. 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 And uh, to just encourage honesty, say, hey, you you can tell me like, man, it just feels like we haven't you know, talked as much. And it's not always even just relationship with a pastor. It can be relationship with other yeah, well team members and uh, just encouraging honesty because I, and I think we've, I've said this before in other podcasts and we'll continue to say it, is that people then want to have a justified reason. So they'll make up like subconsciously make stuff up like, oh, I, I don't think I fit here because the theology isn't good or I mean, literally like make stuff up and <clears throat> excuse me, instead of just being honest that there's change and that the change is hard for them. Yeah. So, yeah. No, great. Guys, thanks so much for being with us for this edition of Unfiltered Podcast, real church planning conversations. Till next time, keep it real, guys. 